4 o'clock news and politics show. I'd like to welcome my next guest, a familiar face, Joseph Melita Flynn. Thank you, Kate. Thanks for coming in today. I just was talking with Jennifer Lawless down inside the Beltway. Of course, big national news. Supreme Court upheld President Trump's travel ban today. And I asked her, you know, was this expected? You know, I don't think it was expected. Um, I do think that the usage of the word travel ban is quite clever when initially it started out very pointedly as the Muslim ban. Uh, the issue is that the president does have really broad powers to enforce issues of national security and those are statutorily given to him. Mm. The way that the courts in the lower levels interpreted that, and we talked about this a few months ago, was that because he'd had this rhetoric about the Muslim ban and about wanting to ban people from Muslim countries specifically, uh, it sort of went above and beyond the powers that were given to him. Now the Supreme Court comes and says, like, sure, that happened, but we're not going to look beyond what the statutory language says. And it's quite a broad holding. It's actually quite scary because it pretty much says that the president can make unilateral decisions about who he's going to allow into the country and that it's going to stand. Well, do you think this, I mean, as you mentioned, it's sort of a litmus test, if you will. This, again, it's the Supreme Court. It's the law of the land under this administration. Um, let's go back to the presidential powers. I mean, is this a slippery slope now? Can you envision other actions under this administration? I mean, I think so, right? So just like we heard him talk negatively about people from Muslim countries, we also heard him say that Mexicans are rapists and the things about Salvadorians and the MS-13 gangs. And so, yeah, sure, I I'm sure that some other things might come of this decision. And maybe then the Supreme Court will want to look beyond uh, the statutory language and look at some of the expressed sentiments of the president. Uh, but for the time being, we're just sort of left in limbo and not really knowing where this is going to go. And so let's talk a little bit about something that had been in the news very much predominantly up until recently when the Trump administration said that it would look to reunite children with their families at the border after we had seen a media barrage of what was happening with children being separated. As we were talking with Jennifer Lawless, it's been very quiet since this has happened. Um, you know, do we have any idea what's actually taking place? No. So I, I do know that there's a huge coalition of immigration attorneys that are going down to Brownsville uh, on July 11th and 12th. I unfortunately cannot be there. Uh, but they're precisely trying to get at the issue of what exactly is happening now. What are the efforts that are actually being made to reunify these children with their parents? Of course, the uh, so we heard the pronouncement that this is no longer going to happen and mm. that the kids are going to be reunited with their parents, but where, right? So are they going to be reunited with their parents in jail, which is where their parents currently are, or are they going to be allowed to go to some happier place than that? Um, and I think that's the next step, is trying to figure that out. As you noticed, uh, this practice had been going on since October. And it wasn't until May, when people started getting loud about it, that something was done, um, supposedly by the influence of the first lady and the first daughter. Uh, I don't know how much I believe that, given the jacket incident. Um, <laughs> but anyway, and so here we are. So it, again, it's about keeping the public pressure going, because the minute we as the public lose sight of what is happening, uh, they can sort of go back to operating in this very nefarious manner undercover, and it's not healthy. Uh, I, for those people who agree with the policies, I do want to say that this is a scary moment to live in, um, and it's pretty much unbridled power by the president. Let's you know, talk a little bit about folks who brought up during this time a lot of the fact that uh, this policy of separating children from families had in fact been in place with previous administrations. But was it really that, that zero tolerance policy and then the proliferation of the numbers because uh, we haven't, have we not seen numbers like this before? We haven't seen numbers like this before. We haven't seen a zero tolerance policy like we've seen recently before. Um, so basically, the way that it works is you're supposed to come up to the border, say that you are seeking asylum, and then there's a process which goes into um, play for you to prove that you have an actual fear of going back to your home country and then be allowed in. Um, that can be a little dicey 
and it has been, and nobody's saying that asylum law has been perfect and working the way that it should be. Uh, there was a process called expedited removal. It still remains in effect, uh, which makes that process go by really quickly, and then people get deported. But this zero tolerance policy, this policy where like no matter who you are, you're going to be charged with illegal entry, um, and then uh, you're going to be separated from your children because you're sitting in jail, that hasn't happened before the way that it's happening now. And whoever is saying that it's happened before uh, is not telling the truth, or they're just exaggerating just a little bit, because it hasn't happened to this extent before. And so you were just at a, a big, a mammoth immigration conference mm -hmm. out on the West Coast there that you said the number of lawyers far exceeded what was even expected there. Talk with us a little bit, you know, from a broad standpoint here, and what was discussed there. I mean, apart from the issues that we're seeing continuously within the media, let's talk a little bit within the legal community um, you know, the issues that are top of hand right now. Yeah, so there was a lot of uh, sort of talk about how to organize around these issues to sort of make impact and um, to bring more issue-based advocacy into the work that we do. And so a lot of the conversation uh, spun from the week prior to the conference. There had been a couple of decisions, not by the president, not by any court, but by the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, uh, which scaled back asylum protections for people who have been victims of domestic violence and gang violence in their home countries severely. And so a lot of the talk was about that, was about how do we deal with this now that this is the law of the land, according to Mr. Sessions, and proceed in a way that we still make good law for our clients. Um, and it's a very tough balance. Uh, the total turnout at the conference, I believe, was in excess of 3,500 attorneys. And uh, it's more than they've had in recent years. Um, as I mentioned, it was more than was anticipated because some people were allowed to register on site. And it created a little bit of disorganized chaos, but it, it was just so encouraging to see so many people who wanted to be there to make sure that we are learning what we need to be learning to help people overcome their immigration barriers. So let's tack, let's take off your immigration lawyer hat, which never really comes off. <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about the Rhode Island Latino PAC. The, we just saw the General Assembly session wrap up here. All eyes are on not just November, but primaries ahead of time. And you've got a big fundraiser this week. So let's, let's go statewide. Let's go to, to state politics and the role of the Latino PAC that you envision with the upcoming elections. So we do have a big fundraiser tomorrow. It is at 6 p.m. at Ladder 133, um, and everyone is welcome. The role of the Latino PAC, as I envision it, is just to make sure that people are aware of what the issues are within the state that are impacting the Latino community. We have a fantastic platform committee, which, which is uh, chaired by former Councilwoman Stephanie Gonzalez, and they've come out with uh, a comprehensive platform, which is what we will use as the litmus, the litmus test by which to assess candidates who are running both in the primaries at the General Assembly level and the City Council level, and then in the general election at the um, statewide office level. Let's talk a little bit about the assembly session that just wrapped up in some of the hot button issues. Let's talk about Kristen's Law. Yeah. This is something that not just the Rhode Island Latino PAC, but a lot in the statewide recovery community from healthcare to community organizations were actually vehemently opposed to for the stringentness of uh, the um, punitive nature of punishing a, a drug dealer or someone who has just simply distributed drugs to someone who then uh, uh, has an overdose and passes away. Talk with us about the importance of this issue for the Rhode Island Latino PAC. It, it's important. So I think, um, and I've been very vocal about the fact that the communities of color are criminalized more often than their white counterparts. That's just, it's statistics. The statistics don't lie, uh, even when we're talking about the same behavior. So if you take a white, um, a white defendant and a Latino or a black defendant, same crime, same set, of, same set of circumstances, the Latino or the black defendants will get punished heavier than the white defendant. And so when you take into account something like Kristen's Law, there are so many more people of color who are currently imprisoned for drug-related crimes. So you can already see who the people are that are going to be affected by this. And it basically sends them away to prison for life or has the potential to do that. The danger is in this. 
Um, and I'm going to give you a hypothetical. Lawyers love hypotheticals. So say I'm not a drug dealer, but I am a drug user. But in order to support my habit, I may sell some of the drugs that I have acquired so that I can continue to support my habit. That makes me a drug dealer and thus can send me away to prison for life if you happen to overdose from the drugs that I sold you to support my habit. So all that the advocates are saying is just take a step back and take a human look at the situation and see that there's a lot of opportunity for resources, for mental health resources, for addiction resources, and spend your money there rather than spending our money our tax dollars on incarcerating more people for prolonged periods of time because that's just not the way to deal with this issue. And as the debate uh, went on up at the State House, was, was there no middle ground here? I mean, it seems to be at one end of the spectrum. There was some middle ground. Uh, there were some intent elements and things that uh, tried to be worked in, but ultimately uh, the way that it passed, it seemed like it just kind of passed without much um, caving from one side, and that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sure that's going to come up in conversation with candidates moving forward. And as you said, the platform coming out of the Rhode Island Latino PAC. While I have you here in studio, Joseph, want to talk with you about municipal ID cards as we're standing here in Providence. Yeah, so municipal IDs are a huge win for the Alorza administration um, and a huge win for the city of Providence. For those who are not familiar with municipal IDs and what they do, it's a basic form of ID that you can obtain if you're a resident of the city of Providence um, and which allows you to have a form of ID when you otherwise wouldn't have. Um, so what are we talking about? We're talking about, again, disenfranchised communities. Undocumented immigrants have no possibility of getting a state-issued ID or license right now. A lot of homeless people find it cost prohibitive and also location prohibitive to get to the DMV. Um, and so now they can go to City Hall and pay a nominal fee to get a municipal ID and sort of restore some dignity to their lives and be able to walk about knowing that if they are stopped by a police officer or if um, a business asks them for identification, that they have a piece of identification that they can actually provide. I'm sure you've seen out there as well some opposition to this. What do you have to say to oppo opponents who simply don't want municipal ID cards? Yeah, so I think the opposition is that it might be, um, it, there's a cost burden obviously to the city associated with issuing the municipal ID cards. Um, but also, I, I think people are afraid that we're normalizing sort of undocumented immigration. I don't think that's what it is. I think people are just coming to their senses and realizing that the people who are here are here and they're not really going anywhere that quickly. Um, and so while they're here, let's treat them with the dignity they deserve while they sort out all of these other issues in their life. Um, and, and I, I, I personally applaud the mayor for getting municipal IDs done. I was in Michigan um, at law school when they did a similar initiative in Washtenaw County in Michigan, which is where I lived at the time. Um, and again, it, it was something that was um, sort of uh, cornered by the immigration advocates. Um, and, and it was a huge success. And it's worked out there. And I'm sure that it'll work out here. Well, we're going to continue to keep an eye on it here. And then we'll have links up tomorrow night for the, to, for the Latino PACs fundraiser for tomorrow night. And we're going to continue to keep an eye on all issues and appreciate your taking the time to come in and give your first Absolutely, here. my pleasure. Okay, thank, thank you so you, much. Joseph. Joseph Melina Flynn, immigration lawyer here in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, also heads up the Rhode Island Latino PAC, and there is a big fundraiser tomorrow night. I want to thank Joseph for taking the time to come in. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back with the Commissioner of Education, Dr. Ken Wagner.